10 years, there was an embargo on Iraq. The American Red Cross International said that 500,000 children died either of starvation or malnutrition or, or, or lack of medicine. Now, I'm not asking what the government should have done. I just know this, that the Church of Jesus Christ has billions and billions of dollars at its disposal. We could have loaded up food and medicine on trucks and taken them across the desert to the people of Iraq. Because my Bible says, when your enemy hungers, you feed him. When he's naked, you clothe him. When you're sick, they're sick, you, you minister to them. You say, you don't bring down a dictator that way. That's funny, because that's exactly the, what the Bible says will bring down the dictator. Only by overcoming evil with good do you bring down coals of fire on your enemy's head. What would have happened to the people of Iraq? Would Christians be fleeing the country today if Christians had in fact responded to their needs? You had 1,300,000 Christians in Iraq. It's now down to 600,000. They're fleeing to Jordan. You heard the woman to Syria and they don't know what to do. They're, they're on the verge of destruction even there. When is the church going to be the church that follows Jesus? And in fact feeds our enemies, clothes our enemies, and thus make them into our friends. I heard the general who led the British troops into Iraq, and he said at the gathering where I was, when will you Americans learn that your security is more dependent on the friends that you make than on the armies you deploy? Do we think, do we think that all of these nuclear weapons that were described just a moment ago are giving us any security? All of that weaponry, and they're going to put a shield over us to protect rockets coming in from who knows where. And all of a sudden, uh, some people here in America got on some American airplanes and shook this country to its foundations. There is no security except in following Jesus. Because all war is built on people who are afraid. That's how we got into this mess. We were afraid. And perfect love casteth out fear. And that's what we need. That's what we need. It's time uh, to go back uh, to the scriptures. And to read those red letters of the Bible. And to let Jesus speak to us. A Jesus who loves all of us. We cannot deal with this issue without dealing with issues in our own household. I'm an evangelical Christian. And I have to tell you, the Christian Zionists in my community have in fact fostered animosity and hatred towards the Palestinian people. And we can't resolve what's going on in the Muslim and Arab world except by dealing with reconciliation between Arabs and Jews and Christians.
I belong to an African-American church in West Philadelphia. I didn't join one. You people moved into our neighborhood. <laughs> and all the white people moved out, except our family, we're Italian. We don't move. <laughs> and it's been good to speak, be with you and, and at this piece gathering, but it's been tough because speaking to an audience that is predominantly white is always tough. <laughs> well, you never know how you're doing with <laughs> going nowhere and some lady in the back yell, help him, Jesus, help him, Jesus. <laughs> I knew it wasn't going well. <laughs> and likewise in my church, when you're really pumping and delivering the word of God, the deacons sit right up on the front row. And they yell, preach, preach. I would have done much better if I had my deacons here instead of you people. <laughs> <laughs> the women in my church wave one hand in the air and go, well, that's it, well. You get 50, 60 women go, well, you're born in the bubble. <laughs> and then in my church, when you were really delivering the word, they stand up and yell, keep going, keep going, keep going, buddy, keep going. I don't get that from my people. <laughs> my people do not yell, keep going, keep going, they yell, stop. <laughs> keep going, keep going. <laughs> Once a year in my church, we have a preach off. You don't even know what that's like. You get about five, six, seven preachers, priests back to back to see who's best. You never say that, you say it's for the glory of God, but we know what it's about. <laughs> it's my turn to preach, and I don't want to brag, people I do not want to brag. I was good. <laughs> no, I was good because the deacons were yelling preach, and women were going well, and men were yelling keep going, keep going, and I feed on that stuff. The more they did it, the better I got, the better I got, the more they did it. I kept getting better and better and better. I got so good. I wanted to take notes on me. <laughs> when I finished, the place exploded. There was cheering and yelling, and I sat down. My pastor hit my knee and said, "You did all right. You did all right." I said, "Are you going to be able to top that, Pastor?" He said, "Sit back. This <laughs> old man is going to do you in." I got up, people, and he did me in. For the next hour, he did me in. One line over and over again. It's Friday, but Sunday's coming. Doesn't sound like much, but you weren't there. He started nice and soft. It's Friday. It's Friday and there's darkness in the world. And there's no light anywhere, but they don't know it's only Friday. Something's coming. Amen. Friday, Jesus is on the cross. And the forces of darkness are in control. But they don't know it's only Friday. Sunday's coming. See, now I thought I'd get something from this crowd. <laughs> this congregation, I will give you one more shot. Yeah. It's Friday, and they're saying a small group of people meeting in a church in the middle of Washington cannot turn things around.